welcome to another episode of the Preparedness Podcast, the podcast that brings you the best in preparedness information. If you're looking for us online, you'll find us at thepreparednesspodcast.com. I'm the host for the show. My name is Rob Hannis, and you can email me at rob at prepcast.info. This show, we're going to be talking about inflation. Uh, I've talked about hyperinflation and how bad it is and stuff, but what I wanted to cover is I wanted to give some examples of inflation as it's happening right now. Uh, inflation is one of those things that we don't typically see very easily because it's it's a slow, very slow uh, thing. Now, lately, it's been a little bit faster, and that's kind of why I think that we might be going into a hyperinflationary event, um, but we might not. And even if we don't go into you know, hyperinflation, we're going to have an issue with rising prices. Um, I'm sure if you talk to any of the old timers that uh, from, you know, the 40s and 50s, 60s, 70s, whatever, and you look at the prices back then to what they are now, there's a distinct difference between how much things cost. So uh, I want to cover just, I've been working on this, uh, this podcast for a few months. And when I started, prices were a little bit higher than they are now. So it's not nearly as dramatic as, as it used to be. Uh, and that's a good example of how prices go up and down, up and down. And this is another reason why we don't, we don't see uh, the inflation taking place as much because they'll go up. People say, oh, it's bad. And then it goes down. It's like, oh, it's not so bad anymore. But over the long haul, the trend is, is upward. So um, I wanted to demonstrate that with some examples. Before we get right into the examples and, and what I wanted to cover, let's uh, let's go over. I just want to do some reminders. Um, the EMP book is out on Amazon. Um, you you probably heard the EMP podcast. If not, go back and, and listen to them. And um, what we've done is we've taken that information, uh, we, we've expanded it a little bit, and we've made it available uh, on Amazon Kindle format for um, low three ninety nine price. Um, and we did that as a way to provide uh, the information to you in one concise format so that you could easily download it. It would also uh, serve as a, an extra revenue um, source for us. Uh, we're always trying to see how we can maximize, um, you know, what we do here because it, it does t take time. It does take money. And so we're always trying to look at ways to uh, to do that. And that's just one of the ways we, uh, we, we came up with. Um, the... Preparedness capability checklist is still um, in development, or I should say it's, it's in being written. I'm nearly done with it. Um, I'm going through the final edit. I'm hoping to have a completely finished writing by the end of this month, uh, January 2013. Um, and I'd like to say it's going to be out at that time, but realistically, uh, there is, well, I'm, I'm going to see if I can find a copy editor because once it's done, I don't really want to have to go back and fix any mistakes or whatever. Um, I also need to submit it to the uh, the printer and uh, request a copy. This is going to be available on print on demand. So you'll be able to get a hard copy of it uh, as well as through Amazon Kindle. So it'll be available in both digital and print format. If you haven't uh, signed up for the weekly tips, I would uh, recommend you go to the website and sign up for the weekly tips. It is a, it's, not just a simple tip like don't eat yellow snow. It's more of a an article or, or perhaps a, uh, a short article on some preparedness aspect that uh, goes into a little more detail, something that I probably don't usually talk about on the podcast because I usually don't have the time to get into too many details. Uh, but um, it's, it's a very popular uh, weekly tip. I've got a lot of people signed up for it. We haven't had anybody unsubscribe at this point. So that tells me that uh, the information is uh, what people are looking for, and I'm really happy about that. Uh, we are going to be releasing the newsletter portion of this. When you sign up for the tips, you're also signing up for the newsletter, and that is going to be basically a, a weekly digest of all the articles and posts that come out on the website. This allows you to basically keep track of what's going on, and if you don't have time, you'll you'll get a little email uh, on Friday. That's That's my goal, to send it out on Fridays. That will allow you to 
you know, keep tabs on what's going on so you don't miss anything important or any uh, interesting articles or even the Prepper News Watch, which is a new aspect on the feature, which, uh, excuse me, a new aspect on the website, which is actually turning out to be one of the uh, more popular aspects of the website. Uh, Monday through Friday, I'm trying to put out a, uh, a selection of links to other websites that have either news or articles. Uh, sometimes they're completely prep related, like uh, recently uh, I've been putting out some about the new guns that are coming out. Uh, we just had the SHOT Show, so there's a lot of information coming from there. Um, there was a new camping lantern from Streamlight that uh, one person or one company at the SHOT Show did a quick video on, so I, we put that up there. Uh, other times it's uh, freedom issues or news or news about the economy, anything that I think um, when I come across it, it has some prepper value to it. I, I throw it up there. Uh, one of the newer portions of that is the uh, freedom uh, section of the Prepper News Watch. And I, I feel that's important because even though it it goes into the political realm, which I try to avoid because um, politics really don't need to come into play to be prepared. You're, you you know, you can be a, a liberal, a conservative, Democrat, Republican, libertarian, doesn't matter. Everybody should be prepared for disasters and, and everyday emergencies. It's something that we all should do. And if we were, we I think we'd be a better country for it. However, um, hand in hand with being prepared are these fundamental and core issues of freedom, being able to do what you want to do. Now, of course, I don't mean to take that as far as you're free to do whatever you want, even if it gets other people hurt. But the simple fundamentals that, quite honestly, that we find in the Bill of Rights, I think have a very strong foundation in preparedness because uh, being prepared, uh, you want to be able to have the freedom to do that. You don't want to be called a hoarder. Uh, you don't want to be called um, a, a, a gun nut just because you want to defend yourself and, and stuff like that. So I think it's a very fundamental aspect of preparedness, and that's why I, I have included it. Uh, getting back to what I had started saying was uh, the newsletter portion, the the, the website feed uh, going to be, or I should say the website digest, the weekly digest will be, I want to start that on February 1st. Uh, and the only reason I say I want to is because I need to um, turn it on and activate it in time for it to be sent out. I've been doing it for the past couple months, sending it to myself to make sure that it's been running and working fine. And now it's just a matter of uh, turning on the entire list. So that's my goal. Because we're going to be talking about inflation, um, one of the things that always comes up, and I don't think we're going to be talking about today because I've talked about it quite a bit, but that is the um, the principle of having durable goods or hard assets or tangible items uh, during periods of inflation. Because what happens is the value of the money that you have uh, goes down and you can't buy as much with it. So if you can buy things before the price goes down and things that are durable, uh, things like computers, um, wash machines, amateur radio, you know, stuff like that, things that aren't consumable and, and uh, are, they're durable is what they call them. If you have those things and you've paid a, a lesser price for them before the price had been inflated. Uh, another way that you can kind of preserve the value of your, your money or your savings is to buy things um, that will retain its value and is easily tradable for either the current money or to other people in exchange. Uh, gold and silver are definitely in that line. I know this is a this seems to be a defining line in preppers in that some preppers don't think uh, that you should have any gold and silver. They I don't think they fully understand the currency slash money aspect of gold and silver because they they come from the standpoint of well you can't eat it so you don't really don't really want it but you know you can't eat bullets uh, you can't eat your ham radio you can't eat your iPhone you can't eat your computer you can't eat the buckets that your wheat comes in, comes in but these are all things that you need in order to be fully prepared or at least better prepared and I'm not saying that you should go out and take your money and uh, uh, buy gold and silver when you should be buying food and water filter and and um, increasing your home security and things like that. But um, if you get to a point where you have your preparedness plan pretty well locked down and it's a matter of just improving it over time, then uh, if you take a look at your savings, take a look at your investments, take a look at what you have and find out, uh, you know, 
do some research. This is a tenet of this podcast is do your own research. Make sure you understand what money is, what gold is, what silver is, and look into getting some. Now, I, I have people um, contact me on a regular basis, you know, ask me who uh, the guy is that I recommend, and that is Jeffrey Bennett from FlyingEagleGold.com. Uh, there is a banner on the website, and at the bottom of the show notes for this podcast, there will be a banner for FlyingEagleGold.com. You can also uh, give Jeff a call. He's got a new phone number, or relatively new. It's uh, 855 by silver, but silver isn't spelled with vowels. So that's 855 289 7587. His email is info at flyingeaglegold.com. Uh, very easy website to get to, flyingeaglegold.com. And uh, I was on a site just today, and I'm seeing here that he has 2013 silver Canadian maple leaves in his possession, ready to be shipped. Uh, it's for you know immediate delivery. You don't have to wait uh, until somebody gets their stock in. He doesn't have outrageous markups on it. So if you're interested in, in getting some silver, uh, you may want to give Jeff a call and find out what he's got going for these uh, these Canadian maples. Uh, he's got a picture here on the website, and they look beautiful. I mean, they're uh, maple leaf on one side, and it looks like Elizabeth II on the other. Um, you know, if it's precious metals, uh, there's a very beauty quality to them. When you get the gold or silver coins in your hand, they they feel great. They've got a nice weight to them. They, if you clink them on the table, they, they sound good. It's not like the cheap clad coins that we have now. But anyways, uh, whether you're looking for something that is pretty, some, you know, pretty coins, or if you're just looking for some uh, gold and silver uh, to hedge your savings, give Jeff a call and uh, he'll help you out. So why is it that inflation is such a bad thing? Um, in my mind, inflation is the silent destroyer of personal savings. It can do this because it happens slowly over a long period of time. Uh, inflation can be difficult to understand as you usually can't see how bad it affects people until it's too late. Now, in this podcast, we're going to be looking at inflation and we're going to try to peel back the corner a little bit and see the ugly truth that lies behind the facade that a little bit of inflation is normal or even desired. Now, you've probably heard this when talking to bankers or economists or, you know, people who believe the whole inflation is good. They believe in the Federal Reserve and stuff like that. Um, no, inflation is bad. Uh, inflation eats away your savings. And, and we're going to we're going to go into that. And I have a, a simple analogy here. So let's say that right now, currently, or any given point in time, you need one hundred dollars for your gasoline every month. That's the amount you have budgeted because uh, at the current prices, uh, that's how much you need. Now, I know that currently, right now, many of you are spending more than that, but stay with me here. I mean, I, I spend more than that a month, but let's just, let's just assume $100. It makes it easy to understand. Now, at $2 a gallon, your $100 can buy 50 gallons of fuel. Now, we haven't seen the price of gas this low since early 2009, which is about four years ago. Uh, this is enough for several tanks of fuel for the average car. Keep in mind that the size of your tank isn't the issue. It's how much fuel you need for the entire month. Now, because I know some people, they, they measure their, their fuel consumption based on, on how many tanks they have. Uh, but really, when it comes to finances and budgeting, you need to um, look at how much it costs you to go a certain distance or for a month of, of travel. So whether you need to fill up five times during the month or just two, it's still the same 50 gallons. Now, when the price of gas goes to $3 per gallon, you can only buy 33.3 gallons with your $100. According to Consumer Reports News, and I'll have a link in the show notes, the average price per gallon of gas right now is $3.30. Diesel fuel is averaging $3.89 a gallon. I have no idea why the lower grade of fuel and that which is simpler to make costs more, but it does. And as my truck uses diesel, I'm not really happy about this because when I bought my truck, 
I bought it because it got better gas mileage. And I thought, yep, it should be good because, you know, diesel is a simpler fuel. It should be cheaper. It gets better gas mileage. That's good. Well, since I hadn't had a diesel before, I didn't really pay attention to diesel prices. Um, but ever since I got the truck 10 years ago, I'm, I've been paying more than gasoline. So I'm not really sure if um, the diesel worked out. And I don't really want to run that calculation because, honestly, I don't really want to know. I own the truck and... Um, whether it works out or not doesn't really make any difference right now for me. So anyways, continuing on. Now, fuel prices are in a constant state of flux, which means they're always changing. So up and down, up and down. Uh, just a few short months ago, when I first started writing this outline, uh, the gas price was $3.82. And at that price, your $100 only bought you just a little bit over 26 gallons of gas. And back when it was three dollars and eighty two uh diesel was uh, over four in fact, I think the max I paid was like four eighty or about this point uh four seventy four c it's hard to it's hard to say, but it was up in the uh upper four dollar range also back then um it was close to being double of what it was four years ago, so at a buck ninety two you know twice that was just under four and uh this outline made a little more sense but i don't want to wait too much longer to get this out so that's why i'm doing it now and as of right now in january of 2013 we're only 70 cents on average from gas doubling what it was four years ago uh, my guess is that we're going to see prices near or above four bucks a gallon again in the not too distant future um, though who knows if it's going to stay there, you know, it, again, it always goes up and down depending on oil prices and world tension and, and stuff like that. But, uh, as time goes on though, it's highly likely that we're going to see higher fuel prices simply because of inflation. Now, when the price of fuel gets to four bucks per gallon, you only get 25 gallons for your same $100. And we're getting to a point where it's about one tanks worth of gas for bigger vehicles. Actually, 25 gallons wouldn't even fit in my uh, my truck's tank, which is about 32 gallons. So if you think about it, I can't even fill up my tank at four bucks a gallon um, with a hundred bucks. So you can start to see how inflation really starts to eat into your budget. If you currently need a hundred dollars for one month's worth of fuel expenses, when the price doubles, you need twice as much to do the same thing as you did before. And that really starts to add up. Now, if it was just fuel that went up, it wouldn't be so bad. You know, an extra 50 bucks or even an extra 100 bucks a month might not be too bad. You might be able to absorb that depending on, um, you know, how your, your home finances are. But when everything goes up at the same time, when inflation is affecting everything, then it becomes a much more serious problem. Now, one of the things that they like to look at is housing prices and stuff like that. But you know what? You don't buy houses on a regular basis. You buy fuel and, and food all the time. So you need to look at those things that you buy on a regular basis. When the uh, gas price gets to five bucks per gallon, you're only gonna be buying 20 gallons of fuel for that same $100. So you can easily see the erosion of buying power for for your money. And this is what inflation does. Now, let's double the current price of gas today. And at $6.60 per gallon, you're only getting 15 gallons of gas. That's 15 gallons or, you know, maybe one tank for a mid-sized car, a little bit over a tank for a small car and about half a tank for a large vehicle like a pickup truck for $100. Four years ago, the price of gas was $1.91. From $1.91 to $3.30 is a 172% increase or a 15% annual inflation. Hmm, 15% annual inflation. That's a far cry from the 2% average that's being reported for the year of 2012. Think about that. They're saying, the government, that we have approximately 2% 
inflation. But yet it's costing you 15% more per year or 172% increase in the last four years for your uh, your gasoline. Something's not making sense here. But see, that's what they do. They, they play with the numbers. And so they can, they can say, oh, inflation is only 2.3% or 3.2% uh, because they're, they're – taking in a lot of other things and they're adjusting it and they're manipulating it and they're, they're skewing the numbers. So it looks better. This is why uh, you as a prepper need to be smarter than the average bear and take a look at what's going on and do your own research and find out the truth. Now I have a link in the show notes. Um, that's a chart that shows you what the inflation rate is. It's inflationdata.com uh, that goes back all the way to the year 2000 um, to or through 2012, and it gives you the average. And the average for 2012 was 2.07 percent. Again, way different than the actual inflation rate for for fuel. So, at the risk of beating a dead horse, another way of looking at this is: you used to buy 50 gallons of gas four years ago for $95.50, but in order to buy the same 50 gallons today, it's going to cost you $165. Again, that's about 15% inflation per year. Now, if you understand inflation, you know, 15% per year is cumulative. So just for example, you start at $100, 15% would be 115. And then the next year would be 15% on 115, not 100. So, you know, it goes up that 15% is cumulative. Now, just to note, I calculated or I should say I double-checked the uh, the inflation calculations uh, using a website called calculator.net, and they have a whole bunch of calculators there, and one of them is an inflation calculator. And again, there'll be a link in the show notes. Okay, so we've talked about the past four years. Let's look ahead. Now, it's difficult to make assumptions like this, but if we assume that this rate of inflation for fuel continues at 15% per year for the next four years. The cost of fuel will be $5.84 a gallon. Now, that's calculating it starting back four years ago when the price was $1.91 per gallon, 15% a year uh, inflation for eight years, uh, and that's what we come up with is $5.84. If we were to start today at $3.30 and calculate 15% a year for four years, uh, the price would only, air quotes, be $5.77 a gallon. So there would be a little bit difference, but that's where that compounding uh, comes into play. So when you compound 15% a year for eight years, it's slightly higher than if you started um, today and did four years in the future. And that's actually... Um, why inflation is bad is because it's a little bit every year. If the inflation is 2% a year, uh, you know, whip out your calculator and, and start with 100 and multiply that by 1.02. That's 2% a year. And do that for 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 years and find out uh, how much percentage is increasing that that's basically 2% inflation. So if something costs a dollar or a hundred dollars, uh, 50 years ago, run that 50 times and you're going to see what the inflation is. Of course, another way and an easier, quicker way of doing this is go to that calculator.net website and run it through their inflation calculator. Or if you have an app on your, uh, your smartphone device or your mobile device that does this too, um, You know, you can calculate that as well. But that's what inflation does is it eats away the value of your savings. Now, I've covered this more back uh, in several podcasts, uh, namely the ones that are on hyperinflation. Inflation is the banker's thief. It's good for them. It's bad for us. It's a clever way for them to pay us back the interest that they owe us uh, with money that is worth less than it was when we originally made the loan. That's that's how it works. Um, that's why it's there. They tell us that, oh, a little bit of inflation is good for the economy. I don't think so. A little bit of inflation is destroying our econo- economy over and over. It's it's If you put a savings, if you put money in the bank, savings, 2 3%, whatever it is, and you calculate what your savings is going to grow, 
you look at that and go, okay, that's not bad. You know, over 20, 30 years, that grows into something. Well, you have to take away what the inflation rate is because the inflation means less buying power. So if you're making 2%, or actually right now, if you're getting anything, you might be getting 1% on your savings account. But if the inflation rate is 2%, and again, that's that's what they're reporting. It really is more than that. But let's just go with that. Um so you got 1% that you're making on your savings. You got 2% annual inflation. You're losing 1% of your money every mo- every year. And that is your savings being eroded away from you. Which, once you understand how this happens and why it happens, you start looking at, okay, what can I put my money into that is going to uh, either grow faster than inflation, which are investments, or where can I, what can I buy that doesn't lose its value or goes up as the dollar goes down? And that's where things like uh, gold and silver come into play. And that's, again, that's where I, I keep suggesting that you should do your research, look into this, because um, when the dollar drops, when the currency or the value of our currency plummets, um, the value of gold and silver are going to skyrocket. And we've already seen this over the past uh, five, six years, actually, you could say ever since the 1970s has been going up, but really it's gone up a lot and over the last five, six years. And that's because that's it holds its value. There's an inverse ratio there. And that's why uh, gold and silver are good hedges to protect your the, the value of your savings. We've also seen inflation affect our uh, prices on food. And I want to cover just some, some basic foodstuffs here. Since 2007. So from January 2007 to December 2012, we've had some price increases. I'm sure you've noticed. Now, this date range uh, encompasses six years, basically the, the last six years. So it's uh, it's fairly recent, and I think it's a fairly good uh, indicator of you know what pr- what prices have have been. And I took 2007 because that was the year uh, just before the recession. And so I think that's a good indicator. We could go back 10 years, but quite honestly, 10 years is a long time ago. I think most of us still pretty vividly remember 2007 just before the recession. And I wanted to hit that period where we had a little bit of inflation, then we had a bit of deflation, uh, and then we're back to inflation. And I wanted to cover that range to see where we are because we had a lot of pressure is going on there. And I think um, we get some good data in here. And this data comes from the BLS website, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, They have a little tool there that you can pull all this information from. I will have a link in the show notes as well as a PDF that I made uh, from this data so that you can just do have a, a quick reference to it. But again, you can do your own research. Um, you, you can pull it all yourself. So let's take a look at bread uh, per pound. Uh, and I'm going to give it to you the 2007 and the 2012 prices. Uh, just know that 2007 is all the way back in January of that year and 2012 is uh, at the end of the year. So that again, a full six year spread. So bread starts off in 2007 at a dollar 15 a pound and ends up 2012 at a buck 44 uh, per pound of bread. That's a 25% increase for a pound of ground beef. 263 ends up 346. That's a 31% increase. A pound of chicken starts at a buck three ends at a dollar 48. That's a 43% increase. Uh, a dozen eggs, buck 55 to a buck 79. That's a 15% increase. A gallon of milk, $3.07 to $3.58. That's a 16% increase. Now check this out. Coffee, a pound of coffee back in 2007 was $3.29. Uh, Last month, $5.92. That's an 80% increase. And actually, the, uh, the the peak price in the last five years for coffee was $6.07. So it even went higher than that. 80% increase. So l- let's, let's look. 25%, 31%, 43%, 15%, 16%, 80%. 80%. The... That is the inflation rate on these specific items. Now, if you average them out, it's going to be over 15%. Uh, 
Uh, even if you uh, took out coffee and just went with uh, bread, beef, chicken, eggs, and milk, that averages out to 26% inflation o- over the past six years. Now, that's not per annual. That's total. Uh, if we run these numbers through that inflation calculator, we find that this is a 6.5% annual inflation. So this demonstrates that you know even 2% can be bad. 6.5% is about what we have on our everyday needs. Uh, fuel is a little bit more, but you can see that 6.5% inflation every year really starts to add up, and it doesn't take that long. Now think about what kind of prices we'd be paying if we get into a massive inflation, which is about 10% a year, 10 to 15 or maybe even 20% a year, and then into a hyperinflation period where we're paying 20% annual inflation every year. You can see how the prices really start to go up. And then if you get into, you know, the, these, I'll call it a super hyperinflation, but it, it, that's not the technical term. It's just um, once I think it's past 20 or 25%, it's just hyperinflation. But I mean, sometimes you're having 300%, 1,000%, 2,000% annual inflation. And the prices just get to a point where they don't even talk about the percentage anymore. They start talking about how long it takes before prices double. And in really bad hyperinflationary uh, events, you're talking about prices doubling in a matter of days, sometimes hours at the extreme. But can you imagine, even if it was prices doubling every three months, you know, whatever cost um, a buck, let's say, well, let's just say your bread costs $2. Uh, in January, and prices are doubling every three months. So, um, three months it uh, goes from two to four, then four to eight, and then eight to sixteen. So, in the course of a year, that bread that cost you two dollars is now costing you sixteen dollars twelve months later. That's hyperinflation, and that's why it's a, a very bad event. And hopefully, we'll never see that. Okay, so this is pretty much the end of the podcast. But before uh, I sign off, I wanted to um, just talk about a few things. Um, I've had some good response, uh, some good feedback on uh, what kind of things you're looking for. We posted on Facebook today, what kind of topics would you would you like us to talk about? And we had some good feedback. And uh, with those uh, suggestions and some of those things I had planned, I've got the next dozen or so uh, podcasts uh, outlined or at least uh, specked out what we're going to be talking about. And some of that includes um, how to handle unwanted guests, um, 72 hour kits, uh, some mobile apps, you know, I'm going to do some listener feedback. So some of the comments that you guys have been making, uh, probably looking at some guns, looking at some, some fitness, going to take a look at, uh, some small scale solar and, uh, go over my, uh, my fast pack system that I keep referring to and, and topics like that. One of the issues that I've had in trying to determine what to talk about is taking into account that I have listeners to the podcast that they started preparing literally last week. There are other listeners who have been preparing for a decade or more. And so trying to cover a breadth of topics that all preppers can listen to has been a challenge. One of the things I want to ask you to do is to take some time and either email me rob at prepcast.info or go to the website, thepreparednesspodcast.com and click on the contact or contact us button and let me know what it is that you would like me to talk about, what kind of topics you want me to cover. Also helpful would be, um, you know, how long you've been preparing. I'm a beginner, I'm intermediate, uh, I'm advanced. That will give me a good indication of how I need to structure and where I need to, uh, what kind of topics I need to go for future podcasts. And that is all I have for the podcast. Until next time, enjoy life and be safe.